What's up, guys? Back by popular demand, we've got Macbeth Act 1. A lot of people who've been going back and redoing the midterm or trying to redo their theme uh, that we wrote about for the compare and contrast instead of rehashing Hector versus Achilles, which is painful for all of us. They want to just try something in a similar format, talking about either Lady Macbeth or Macbeth, going back to that question on the first midterm where, uh, where we asked, did Lady Macbeth actually love her husband? So for all those people or for anybody out there who's just bored and honestly wants to go back and listen to me talk about Shakespeare some more because, let's be honest, daytime television isn't all that it's cracked up to be. I am here for you and I'm ready to help. So without further ado, let's go back and redo Macbeth Act 1. Macbeth? No, Macbeth Act 1. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. So, here we go, Act 1, Scene 1, Thunder and Lightning, three witches come on stage. What you need to know about these witches before you get into it is you need to think about what lens you want to view them through. Now, Shakespeare's audience back in the day would have seen these witches as, like, clear placeholders for devil worshippers, all right? And if you look at some of the ingredients in their spells and some of the stuff they talk about, that could be very easily the right way to look at them. On the other hand... They pray to Hecate, or Hecate, the Greek goddess. And if you've got three weird sisters gathered around a cauldron in Greek mythology, that's not witches. That's the three fates, the, the three beings that control all human existence and outcomes. So whatever the case may be, you need to keep in mind how you look at these three witches. If they're just witches, then it's their duty to manipulate and corrupt Macbeth to win his soul over to the devil. And that's a perfectly legitimate interpretation for what they're doing on stage. On the other hand, if you go with the Greek mythology interpretation, they're not so much interested in getting Macbeth messed up so much as they are just doing what needs to be done in order for Macbeth to have his fated outcome, pushing him towards what he's supposed to do according to the infinite tapestry that they weave. So it's up to you to decide whether or not these guys are, are evil or just powerful and uncaring in terms of how that power affects humanity. But keep that in mind as we go forward. So let's start with the famous opening lines. These have popped up everywhere from Harry Potter up through popular music. You know them even if you don't think you know them. When shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be ere the set of sun. Where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. Okay, so there you have them plotting what their next step is going to be. The other thing you need to pay attention to always with these witches is the double meanings of their language, the way they play with words and the way they play with meanings so that when they say things, it doesn't necessarily mean what you think it's saying, the way they equivocate. Now, it could be Shakespeare includes this because he's talking about the, the equivocator who was put on trial for the attempted assassination of King James I during the time in which Shakespeare was writing this. Or you can, can look at it as... This is just something that Shakespeare talks about in a lot of his plays, which is how you can manipulate people by offering them what they want or making them hear what they think they want, even when you mean something else. Either way, when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, so right away you've got this, this paradox, when the hurly-burly is done, when all the, the noise is over, when the trouble is over, when the battle is both lost and won. And you need to think about, like, what are the possible meanings? How can a battle be both lost and won? And superficially, it, it seems pretty clear. Like, on the surface, that just means, okay, in a battle, there will be a winner and a loser. One side wins, the other side loses. That's, that's how a battle is both lost and won. But it could mean something else. It could mean that in order to win losses have to be taken, that you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, that losses come as a price for victory. 
So there's always these double layers, these these meanings and meanings with what the witches have to say. And you need to be tuned in and paying attention to that because that's essential to who they are and what they do and what they're going to do in terms of how they manipulate the man they're waiting to meet, Macbeth. Now, another major theme that comes out here in Macbeth is the reversal of the natural order. So in these next lines, the witches are talking to their familiars. Uh, those of us who, who pay attention to TV shows and movies or books that have witches in it, a lot of times, even in Harry Potter, it's not uncommon for magical beings to have pets that assist them in their magical duties. Harry Potter has his owl. Hermione has her cat. It's, it's, it's something that is, is typical in a lot of stories about witches. But in Shakespeare's Macbeth, Throughout the entire play, the natural order of things gets reversed as a sign of evil or at least disorder. And so as these witches speak to their pets, it becomes clear that it's the pets who are in control of the witches, not the witches who are in control of the pets. So the first witch says, I come, Grey Malkin. Her cat is calling her. Paddock calls. Anon. And then we get the, the famous refrain, the paradox that tells you what they're trying to do within the world. Where fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through fog and filthy air. Fair is foul. Good is bad and bad is good. This reversal of the natural order of things is all throughout this play. The man that we believe is a hero becomes a tyrant. The, the woman who is his loving wife becomes his manipulative abuser. The, the man who is celebrated as a hero becomes a traitor. The man who's called a traitor is someone who loves his family and who sacrifices everything for his country. So fair is foul, foul is fair, good is bad, and bad is good for these witches. And they're going to create that situation in reality with the actions that they take. So the witches disappear, and now we cut to still not Macbeth on stage. Now we get a, a scene with King Duncan, the King of Scotland, speaking to his son, and a sergeant who comes back to report on the battle that's been taking place. Now, as far as characterization goes, there's a ton of characterization. The way we learn about the characters in our play taking place in this scene. The way you can learn about someone, both in real life and in fiction, is look at three things. The most important thing you can look at is what that person does. Actions speak louder than words. We don't have any actions from Macbeth yet on stage, so we don't know anything about him. But there are some actions here implied about both Malcolm and Duncan that are going to be important. They're going to talk about actions that Macbeth has taken, and that's an important thing too. The way other people talk about them is another way we learn about people, both, once again, in life and in fiction. Finally, the things that people say tell you about who they are, but you need to be careful with that because people can lie. So those three things will all be on display throughout this play, what people say, what people do, and what other people say about them. The most important ones in this particular scene are what people are doing or have done and what people say about it, all right? So the scene begins with King Duncan addressing a bloody soldier who's being carried past him and says, What bloody man is that? He can report, as seemeth by his plight, the revolt of the newest state. So the king is saying, like, look, that guy just came back from the battlefield. I can tell from his wounds. He can tell me what's going on. Okay, that's what the words mean, but there's a subtext to that. And the subtext to that is Duncan, the king, doesn't know what's going on. He has to have somebody who works for him, a lowly sergeant, tell him what's happening in the world. Duncan the king is out of touch. 
Duncan the King doesn't know what's happening. He's not out fighting on the front lines. He's sitting behind in his camp waiting to hear about the outcome of the battle. All of this is important in terms of how we understand the actions that happen later on in this play. Malcolm, Duncan's son, then replies, This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend, and say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Okay, got some important things happening here with just those short few lines that Malcolm speeches. Now, one, he gives legitimacy to the soldier's report. He tells the audience, we can trust this soldier because he's a good soldier who, in fact, saved Malcolm from captivity. That's important because the other thing that means is Malcolm wasn't strong enough as a soldier to save himself from captivity. So it could be a hint as to Malcolm's personal weakness or his soldierly weakness. Or let's be honest, with the way they looked at masculinity in Macbeth's time and the way we even still look upon it, masculinity as being necessarily violent a lot of times, glorifying our masculine heroes in violent movies and in violent sports. Uh, Malcolm doesn't match that measure of a man, either in Shakespeare's time or really in our own. So the sergeant can talk about the battle insofar as it had progressed before his wounds made it so he had to leave. And now the sergeant speaks up doubtful if stood as two spent swimmers that do cling and choke their art so he begins with a metaphor it was uncertain how the battle was going to go nobody knew what the outcome was the two armies were tired and like swimmers who were drowning they were just clinging to each other alternately pulling each other down and holding each other up like like two people trying not to drown that's the image that we get of the, the armies that are fighting out on the field. The merciless MacDonwald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him, from the western isles of Kearns and Gallow Glasses is supplied. And fortune, on his damned quarrel smiling, showed like a rebel's whore. So in the beginning, MacDonwald, a Scottish thane, looked like he was going to win. He had a bunch of troops that he had gotten from Ireland. That's the, the Western Isles, the Kearns and Gallo Glasses supplied. He hired a bunch of mercenaries from Ireland to come over and be his army. And in the beginning of the battle, it looked like he was going to win. Fortune, and I think here they mean the capital F, Fortune, once again from Greek mythology, the lady who spins the wheel and then determines if you get a good or a bad outcome. Fortune, in the beginning, was smiling on MacDonwald. And just in case you guys don't remember, let's talk about what a thane is. So in Scotland at this time, there was a king, but it wasn't so much king the way like King Arthur exists. The, the, here is this king who is chosen by God to lead his people. Like that was not the situation in Scotland. Scotland was much more chaotic. Scotland in, in this time had a king, but the way you became king and the way you maintained the fact that you were king was you paid thanes who were essentially warlords to supply you with troops and who would use those troops to collect taxes, some of which they would keep, the rest of which they would pass on to you so that you could pay other thanes. So MacDonwald was somebody who was supposed to be loyal to his king. He had his own troops, but he got tired of working for the man and wanted to be the man. So he used his money to hire a bunch of mercenaries from Scotland to come on over and help him overthrow Duncan. And in the beginning, it looked like it was going to work until, and we'll pick it up in the middle of the line here, but all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the knave to the chops and fixed his head upon our. 
battlements. So the battle was going badly until Macbeth steps up. Brave Macbeth. And the sergeant tells us he deserves to be called Brave Macbeth because he single-handedly carved his way through the enemy army until he came face to face with McDonwald and then he unseamed him from the nave to the chops. And what that means is Macbeth, after cutting his way through an entire army, comes up against McDonwald and he chops him in half from the groin to his, to his chin. This does a lot as far as characterizing Macbeth. Macbeth is a great warrior. Macbeth is a dangerous fighter. Macbeth is somebody who will face an entire army all by himself. We don't have the luxury of seeing this in Shakespeare's play because it was a bare stage and he couldn't fit an entire army on it. So instead he had to have a character come on and describe it. If you want a visual to go with it, I highly recommend the 2015 uh, Amazon Prime version of Macbeth. It's brutal in terms of the way it depicts the violence, and it makes some very interesting choices about how it makes Macbeth and Lady Macbeth a lot more sympathetic characters. But its depiction of this actual historical battle here, the Battle of Elan, it's it's... It gives you the visual to go along with what the soldier is describing here. And for a lot of us living in this, this age in which we're accustomed to having the graphic to go with it, it's helpful. If you prefer to use your imagination, which is the way I am because I'm old school, it's enough just to understand that Macbeth cuts his way through an entire army, comes up against the big leader of that army and cuts that dude in half, then takes his head and fixes his head upon our battlements which is the customary way that people in England and Scotland dealt with traitors. If you betrayed your king or your country, the way they punished you is they chopped off your head and they put it on a pike, uh, a long spear that they would then put on the wall of the castle, usually near a gate, so that everybody who came into the castle got reminded of this is what happens to people who are traitors. And this is going to be especially powerful for Shakespeare's audience because at the time this play was in production, when the first audiences were coming to see Macbeth, many of them would have to walk through the part of London that's called Traitor's Gate. And on that gate, there would be the severed head of Guy Fawkes and the people who assisted him with their dead eyes and rotting flesh staring down on them because they were traitors to King, J King James I. So you've got Shakespeare doing a lot here, characterizing his characters for the people who are coming to the play in his time, making it so that we can read it 500 years later and have it still make sense, making it so it would resonate emotionally with the people of his, his time. There's a ton of stuff going on here, very economically handled by the author. Now, Duncan is stunned and amazed at this good news, at this good fortune. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. So here he's clearly celebrating he's happy Macbeth won. The guy who betrayed him lost and now doesn't have a head. Woohoo! He also calls Macbeth his cousin. Now, that doesn't mean cousin the way we understand it in modern times, but it does have significance. Duncan is saying and letting the audience know that Macbeth is related to him by blood. And that's going to be important the idea of blood, and also the idea of the fact that Macbeth is related to him as this play progresses. The sergeant isn't done telling his story because things in the world were just getting wackier. As whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunder break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark. No sooner justice had with valor armed compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying his vantage, with furbished armed and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. So the sergeant is like, dude, I'm not done talking yet. This was just the calm before the storm. No sooner had Macbeth and his army put the Irish mercenaries to flight, made them run away, 
But the king of Norway, seeing an opportunity, seeing that Scotland was weak, chose this moment to attack. So right after Macbeth puts down Macdonwald and his army, a second army shows up and begins a new assault against Macbeth and his already tired and fatigued troops. Duncan can't believe this. Dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo. So Duncan's like, oh God, what happened? Did, did they run away? Because that's what a reasonable person would have done. My army has already been fatigued and taken a lot of casualties in this first victory. Now we have to fight a whole new army with fresh troops. A reasonable person faced with that situation would try to run away. And so the sergeant says, yes, they were dismayed. As sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion, if a sparrow can frighten an eagle, then yes, Macbeth and Banquo were frightened. If a rabbit can frighten a lion, then yeah, Macbeth and Banquo ran away. Now we know that's not possible. So therefore we know Macbeth and Banquo didn't run away. If I say sooth, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks. So they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. Except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds and memorialize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. So before the soldier starts to pass out from the loss of blood here, he says, Macbeth and Banquo didn't run away. In fact, they fought harder against this new army. They were like cannons that you fixed with not a single dose of gunpowder, but a double stack of gunpowder. They went off. And they attacked the, the new army with twice the aggression that they had in the first battle. They were just warming up, apparently. And they shed so much blood, the sergeant couldn't tell whether they were just trying to bathe themselves in blood, or if they were trying to create another killing field similar to the place where Jesus was crucified. Now, Duncan is so pleased by this. He's like, y'all got to take care of this guy. So well thy words become as thy, thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Get him to the surgeon. So the sergeant's carried off. And then Duncan sees Ross coming on stage and says, who comes here? So, sorry. So Ross is going to finish explaining what happened at the battle after the sergeant had to be carried off because of his wounds. So Malcolm, remember the son of Duncan says, the worthy Thane of Ross. Lennox, another Thane says, what haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. Ross greets them, God save the king. Whence camest thou worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian bowers flout the banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict. Till that Belladonna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude... The victory fell on us. So Ross comes in and the battle's over. At first, Norway attacked and it looked like they were just going to crush us. Our people were cold with fear. And it turns out we had another traitor. The Thane of Cawdor was assisting him. And they began a new battle. But then Macbeth. Like Beldana's bridegroom, most of Shakespeare's audience would know they're talking about like Ares, the god of war, showed up and showed him the truth of who he was and how much he lacked in comparison to Macbeth. And to make a long story short, we won. Duncan is happy about this. Great happiness. But there's a double, double meaning going on here too. You need to ask, is, is Duncan really a good king? 
His country just got invited, in, invited, invaded twice on the same day. Does that maybe tell you he might not be the strongest king? Not only is he not out there fighting, hanging at the back, waiting to find out what the outcome is, but people look at him as an opportunity to advance themselves. That's something that's going to be important as we go forward. The Thane of Ross then goes on to say that now Sueno, the Norwegian's king, craves composition. Nor would we dine him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Calm's inch $10,000 to our general use. So Ross says, this isn't all. Not only did we defeat him in battle, but Sueno, the king of Norway, was there. And we told him we wouldn't even let him bury his dead troops until he donated $10,000 at the church for our general use. So not only does Macbeth save Duncan's kingdom twice in the same day, he gets Duncan's government another $10,000 that they can spend however they want. And they haven't even begun negotiating the terms of peace with Norway yet. Things are looking awful good for Duncan. Duncan, though, doesn't dwell on his good fortune. Instead, he starts thinking about how Cawdor, the thane that was supposed to serve him, actually betrayed him. No more that thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom, bosom interests. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth. Hath won. So, Thane of Cawdor betrays me as the king. All right, I see him now. He's not going to trick me ever again. Have him executed. And take his former title, which means the land that he controls, the taxes that he gathers, the troops that are his, and give them to Macbeth. So in one day, Macbeth has a lot of double successes. All right. He defeats two armies. He doubles the size of his holdings and power and land and wealth. He's now Thane of Glams, which is the territory that his, was his initially. And now he will become the Thane of Cawdor. What Cawdor hath lost, noble Macbeth has won. And then that echoes the words of the witches from the previous scene. When the battle is lost and won. Cawdor lost, and Macbeth has won. Or has it? Let's keep seeing. We cut away from the happiness in Duncan's court and their victory to, once again, thunder and lightning. The witches are, are on the heath, which just means the, the, the Scottish countryside, which is not a particularly friendly or forgiving place. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful, but it's, it's stark and it's harsh. Once again, in the 2015 version of Macbeth that was filmed in Scotland, they do an absolutely beautiful job of showing like how hard the country is, but also how beautiful it is as well. So the witches are having a conversation, and this gives you more characterization and insight into the witches. Once again, you have to decide for yourself, are they evil because they're devil worshippers? Are they just evil because they do bad things in order to manipulate the affairs of men? Are they fate? Are they satanic? You decide. The first witch begins. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I. Aroint thee, witch, the rump-fed runyon cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve, I'll tither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. So, the meeting has getting started. They're on the heath to meet Macbeth, like they said, but they were running a little bit late. And the sisters would like to know why their other sisters are late to the party. So 
the the second witch was running late because she was killing pigs <laughs> the pigs the filthy animals that that muslims and jews will not touch that that it's if they are orthodox in their beliefs they are such filthy animals that they cannot be eaten or or consumed or kept she was out killing them <laughs> all right so that tells you a little bit about her the first witch was running late because she had a bit of a run-in with a human being. A sailor's wife was eating chestnuts. And when the witch asked her to share, the woman said no. And because she said no to the witch, the first witch is going to punish her husband. He's master of the tiger. He's captain of a ship named the tiger. But I will sail after him and like a rat without tail i'm gonna get him all messed up and the witches who are her friends jump in as to how they'll help i'll give thee wind thou art kind and i another and i myself have all the other so these witches have the ability to control the weather and to control the wind and now that they're working together they're going to use that power to to make this sailor's life hell and the very ports they blow, and all quarters that they know, in the shipman's card I will drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. Weary sin nights nine times nine shall dwindle peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. So now the witch goes into greater detail about how she's going to mess with this sailor. All right. The winds are going to push this sailor around so that he can find no port. He can know no peace. She will drain him of his energy. He won't be able to sleep day or night. He'll never be able to even close his eyes and know peace until seven nights times nine times nine have passed. That's how long he can go without sleep. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. They don't have the power to kill him, but they can make him wish he was dead. And now they start going into the ingredients for the spell. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked his homeward he did come. So... To, to make sure that their spell works, the final ingredient that they need is a captain, a sailor's thumb, a severed thumb. It's up to you to figure out how the witches happened to acquire a man's thumb, but they're going to use that to make sure that this man knows no peace. Then, ba-boom-boom, boom, we hear a drum. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus do go about, about, thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. So they cast this spell, and it's up to you to figure out whose, whose fate they're tying up in knots. This sailor, or is it Macbeth? Maybe there's a double meaning in that speech itself. Were they actually talking about a sailor's wife, or were they talking about Lady Macbeth? Is the sailor they're going to torment actually Macbeth? He was called a captain by the king. Maybe that's what's going on here. Macbeth and Banquo, the thanes that were leaders of the armies who defeated the invaders from Ireland and from Norway, are now walking through the forest on their way to meet the king. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is it called to fours? And what are these, so withered and wild in their attire, that they look not like inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it? Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me, by each one at once, her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be woman, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So once again, we get uh, a character reacting to the witches before we see Macbeth's reaction. 
And there's characterization here in terms of what Banquo says about them. So when we go back and we look at the way the witches are portrayed in various different different film adaptations, I think it's imperative that based on the text, you have to understand that these witches are not beautiful. They are not seductive in terms of their physical appearance, even though, as you'll see, they sometimes are portrayed as such. And I think it makes sense to portray them as beautiful because beauty is seductive. Uh, when you look at the way human beings discriminate in the world, one of the, the most frequent forms of discrimination is physical attractiveness. And it happens at even young ages. Kids in daycare who are cute get more attention than the kids who are less. And so you can make the witches in the, the production and the movie of your mind beautiful if you want to, but you got to ignore a pretty substantial line here when Banquo, looking at the witches, says, you have the bodies of women, but you have beards that tell me that you're not women. <laughs> So, saying they're beautiful, given that they have beards, maybe not. I mean, don't get me wrong, I have a beard, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not, not that beautiful. Anyway, so we get Banquo's reaction to them first. They're apparently lost. He says, how far is it to the castle of Duncan? And then he's like, wait a minute, who the heck are these ladies? Macbeth then addresses them. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glams. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth. Thou that shalt be king hereafter. So it's interesting. When Banquo is talking at them, asking them questions, they don't respond to him. They put their fingers over their lips, telling him, shh. But when Macbeth says, speak, what are you? They answer. And they say, hail. Which means like, bow down in respect and servitude to Macbeth. Thane of Glams, which he knows. He was the Thane of Glams when the morning started. Thane of Cawdor, which we in the audience know he's about to become, but he doesn't know yet. And then, thou that shalt be king hereafter. Now that's got Macbeth's attention. Now Banquo doesn't react to what the witches say. He reacts to how Macbeth reacts to the witches. And Macbeth, apparently according to the text, has a pretty interesting reaction to being told he's going to become king. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that sound so fair? So Macbeth's looking scared when these ladies say he's going to become king. Now that seems weird to me. I was like getting my fortune told and somebody told me I was going to become a king. I'd be like, all right, cool. I think what's going on here, the way you have to understand this is, imagine your deepest, darkest, most secret desire, the thing that you haven't shared with anyone. And then all of a sudden, a stranger just busts out and says what it is. Would that freak you out a little bit? Would that bother you? I think for most of us, it would. And I think that's why Macbeth looks scared when they say he's going to be king. Banquo gets no response from Macbeth, so he turns his attention back to the witches. In the name of truth, are ye fantastical? Or that indeed which ye outward show? My noble partner you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and royal hope, that he seems wrapped with all. Yet to me ye speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and see which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither fear nor beg your favors nor your hate. Now Banquo lets loose on the witches here. Why are you just talking to Macbeth? You're giving him all these bold predictions. What do you see for me? Tell my future. If you can tell what's going to get bigger and what's going to get smaller, what's going to happen with me? Not that I care, because I ain't scared of you. 
And I don't really need your prediction to live my life. But if you're going to tell him, tell me. And then the witches turn their attention to him. And similar to how they greeted Macbeth, it's again, hail, hail, hail. Now, once again, pay attention to the double language, the paradoxes that the witches use that will become clearer as the play progresses. Lesser than Macbeth and greater, not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. So the witches have pretty exciting predictions for Banquo, although riddles of predictions. So Banquo, you're lesser than Macbeth, but you're also greater than him. You're not going to be as happy as Macbeth, but you're also going to be a lot happier. You shall get kings. Your children will be kings, though you will not. So, seemingly positive, happy fortunes for both Macbeth and Banquo. Although, maybe not as happy as they might on the surface seem. Because if Macbeth is going to become king, but then Banquo's children are going to come after, well, maybe things aren't quite so happy. Now Macbeth wants more information. The witches start to leave, but he says, Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinel's death I know I am Thane of Glams, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge you. But the witches vanish. So Macbeth is confused by what he's told. He can't be Thane of Cawdor. There already is a Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth knows him. So that's impossible. Furthermore, what's really impossible is the idea that I'm going to become king. You got to tell me more about this, Macbeth says. But before he can get his information, the witches disappear, leaving just him and Banquo to try to sort out what in God's name just happened. Okay, so Macbeth and Banquo just saw some pretty crazy, kind of trippy stuff. These ugly old women appeared out of nowhere, told them some crazy predictions about their future, and then straight up vanished into thin air. And so what follows in this conversation is Macbeth and Banquo internally trying to figure out what they just heard means to them, and also testing the other person to see, like, did I hear what I thought I heard? Did you hear what I thought I heard? Because um, if these ladies can appear and disappear, they might be able to make them see and hear things that aren't real. And, and that's sort of what this conversation entails. Banquo, after seeing the witches vanish, his response to that is, The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? So Banquo is just like, that was weird, but maybe not totally unnatural. Crazy stuff happens all the time. Maybe this is just some of that crazy natural stuff. Macbeth isn't so sure about that, into the air, and what seemed corporeal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed? So it's interesting. Macbeth doesn't know what to make of it, but he just wishes they had stayed a little bit longer so he could have gotten more out of them, so that he could have talked to them more. And again, this gives you the, 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 the skeptic and the believer from that would become archetypes in every horror, horror movie that you'll ever see. So Banquo and Macbeth start testing each other to kind of see, like, did is this real or did we imagine it? So Banquo begins, Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? So did we eat some magic mushrooms? Are we seeing stuff that isn't real? Macbeth starts saying what he heard to check with Banquo if he was right with what he heard. And Macbeth says, your children shall be kings. And Banquo's response is, you shall be king. Macbeth can't deny it, so he's just like, 
and Thane of Cawdor too. Was it not so? Banquo agrees. So yeah, we heard the same thing to the self-same tune and words. Who's there? Or who's here, if you want to read the line correctly. And again, that's a really important line. Who's here? Who's there? That sort of questioning pops up all throughout this play. Because just like the, the witches have uh, double meanings and, and a double identity between, like, are they devil worshippers? Are they Greek mythology witches? You, you've got every character in this play kind of has a little bit of a double front, a double personality, just like humans have a double personality. We're capable of good and evil. We can be fake to someone's face and be real underneath it. This idea of duality and questioning who am I talking to is all throughout the rest of this play. It's just another of the motifs that I want to point out. So Ross comes on stage and Ross is here to deliver the information that we in the audience already know, but is going to be news for Macbeth. All right, so Ross comes in, he's super happy. He says, the king hath happily received Macbeth, the news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels fight, his wonders and his praises do contend, which should be thine or his. Silenced with that and viewing over the rest of the self same day, he finds thee in the stout Norwayan ranks. Nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death. As thick as hail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in thy kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. So Ross shows up and he's like, Macbeth, we have been hearing some crazy stories about what you've been doing on the battlefield today. Every new messenger that comes in bringing tales of first the battle against Macdonwald, and then later the battle against Norway, all of them sing your praises, and all of them just continue to amplify and speak up about the great deeds you've done this day in your nation's defense. And the king doesn't know what's greater, the victory that's been won for him or the individual achievement that you've won by yourself. And as such, he's ready to reward you. And that's what Angus is going to pile on here and say. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not to pay thee. So Angus is like, hey, we got good news. You're going to get repaid for the great works you have done this day. But before you get too excited, we're not going to pay you. I'm not carrying cash for you. You're going to come with us to the king so he can reward you himself in person. So Ross is going to give a little bit more of a spoiler about the good news that Macbeth does have coming for him. And for, in an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition hail most worthy Thane, for it is thine. So Ross is like baiting that exciting hook for, for Macbeth and says, there's an even bigger honor that you'll hear from the king himself, but I can give you one honor right now. You have been named the Thane of Cawdor. So Macbeth, you have now doubled your holdings of land, of warriors, of income. You are now the most powerful thane in all of Scotland, essentially in power second only to Duncan. And there's even bigger news coming from the king. And at this, Macbeth has to be thinking what? Holy cow. Is Duncan going to name me king to be is he going to say when i die my crown will pass to macbeth because of the great services i've done this day have i earned the crown like the weird sisters told me and so that's what's probably running through macbeth's mind when he hears these words but he can't just take the joy of them as joy because if he's the thane of cawdor what happened to the other thane of cawdor that's where he goes with this next part of the conversation. Additionally, Banquo, anticipating Macbeth's thoughts, says, What? Can the devil speak true? And Macbeth has to check here. He says, The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Now, these borrowed robes are incredibly important. This is another motif that keeps popping up throughout the play. Have you guys ever heard the expression, the clothes make the man? That expression actually originates in Shakespeare. He's the one who came up with it. It pops up in another one of his plays called Hamlet. 
And in this play, the idea of the clothes making the man is undercut. I mean, if I dress up like a cop, does that make me a cop? No, the clothes don't make the man. We, we see that all the time with like the horrible things that people in uniform do. Clothes don't make you what you are. I wear a tie to school every day. That doesn't make me a good teacher. The stuff I do in the classroom, my actions either make me good or bad. The clothes I wear don't. So that whole idea of the clothes make the man, yeah, that's actually something that dates back to Shakespeare, but the thing you got to keep in mind about that quote it's said by a guy who in that play is an absolute idiot and a liar. Okay, so whenever somebody tells you the clothes make the man, you need to check them and be like, nah, that's from Shakespeare and that's a fool saying that statement. And so if you take that as gospel truth, you yourself are a fool. Because Macbeth feels like he hasn't earned the Thane of Cawdor. So for him to be given the the ceremony and the stature of that position, he's like, huh, -uh, that, that doesn't make any darn sense, man. Now, Angus's response is to tell Macbeth how he became the Thane of Cawdor. Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life, which he deserves to lose. So yeah, the Thane of Cawdor is still alive, but not for long. He's a traitor is guilty of being a traitor and he's going to be executed. And before his execution, he's been stripped of his land and his title and that land and that title is now given to you, Macbeth. What Cawdor hath lost, Macbeth hath won. Whether he was combined with those of Norway or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage or that with both he labored in his country's wreck, I know not. But treason's capital confessed and proved have overthrown him. So Angus is like, look, I don't know the full story, but Cawdor committed treason. Cawdor betrayed Duncan, and price for his betrayal is losing his land and his titles and being put to death. Reward for what you did this day is you are now the Thane of Cawdor. And now Macbeth, internally, he steps aside and we hear his internal thoughts where he says, Glams and Thane of Cawdor, the greatest is behind. Then he says to Ross and Angus, thanks for your pains. And he pulls Banquo aside because he's like, dude, we need to talk about this. These witches have apparently told us the truth and I want to talk to my friend about what this stuff means. Do you not hope your children shall be kings? When those that gave Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them. So he's like, do you believe this stuff? Now Banquo in his response, he's a lot more skeptical than Macbeth about trusting these witches. He's like, man, I don't trust these witches. They might be trying to mislead us into evil by telling us something true. Check it out. That entrusted home might enkindle you unto the crown besides Thane of Cawdor. So if you believe them, that might cause you to maybe betray your own king. I'm not sure we want to trust them enough to do that yet. Then he continues, but tis strange. And oft times to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. Win us with honest trifles to betray in deepest consequence. And what he's saying there is like, look, man, the devil can speak the truth. He's answering his own question earlier. The devil can be perfectly honest when it suits his purposes. I mean, the devil can quote scripture when it suits his purposes. He can definitely tell you the truth in order to get you messed up. Maybe these witches have told us the truth about little things in order to get us to commit deeper betrayals later on. And the biggest betrayal a person can do is if you are a subject to rebel and commit treason against your king. That's one of the bigger sins a, a person in a position of power like Macbeth can commit. And Banquo is cautioning him here, man. He's saying, look, you can't trust those witches just yet. It could be they told you that truth about the Thane of Cawdor in order to make you turn against Duncan. And that, that would send your soul to hell. So don't get yourself messed up yet, son. Now, Banco steps aside with Angus and Ross, saying, Cousins, a word, I pray you. And then Macbeth has a couple of asides here that he interrupts himself 
to talk to Angus and Ross and Banquo, those dashes in there indicate where he interrupts his thoughts to speak to them, and then he goes back into his own thoughts. So he begins talking to himself. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of imperial theme. So despite the fact that Banquo says don't trust these ladies, Macbeth trusts these ladies. He's the believer. Two truths are told. Now, once again, there's that duality, that double image in there. Macbeth isn't thinking that maybe this is a two-faced truth. Maybe this is a double meaning statement. He's just taking them at their word. They've told me two truths. I am the Thane of Cawdor now. I'm going to be king. Happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. He believes Duncan is going to name him king. King to be. Then he interrupts himself to, to talk to Ross and Angus, Angus and says, like, Oh, I, I thank you, gentlemen. A lot of times on stage this is like played out as they offer him a drink or they say something and then he's like, Nah, I'm good. And then he goes back into his own thoughts to say, It cannot be ill. It cannot be good. If ill... Why hath it given the earnest of success, commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? So Macbeth is weighing this information that the witches have given him here, and he doesn't know what to make of it. It can't be good. It can't be bad. It can't be bad because they told me the truth. And can the truth ever be bad? Well, if you're a critical thinker in the audience, heck yeah, the truth can be bad. Now, it's always better to know the truth than to be deceived, but that doesn't make the truth nice. It doesn't make the truth good. But Macbeth associates truth with goodness. I'm not sure that's always the case. There are some unhappy, unpleasant truths that you will encounter in this life. But for Macbeth, since the witches told him the truth, what they say has to be good. But there's a double side to that as well. Because what those witches told him is making him think about doing something that makes this man, this hardened warrior, this hero, scared. It makes his hair on his arms stand up like it has its own life. It makes his heart pound against his ribcage. Because what he's thinking about doing is murdering his own king. Making himself king. Now that, that's something that Macbeth knows is wrong. But it's also something Macbeth really wants. Y'all ever been in that situation? Where you know it's wrong, but it's also what you really want? There's a reason why we keep reading Shakespeare 500 years later. Society has changed people have not. Macbeth continues, present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not. So this good and this bad, this fear and this exhilaration that Macbeth is feeling right now, in his mind, it cancels everything out. It's a positive one and a negative one equaling zero. And so on the inside, he just feels empty, a void. In a way, the witches have stolen his triumph from him, even the reward that he's been given, Thane of Cawdor which would have been out of his dreams a few hours ago. Now it isn't enough. And isn't that the truth about human beings? Once we get something, even if it's something we really, really, really wanted, is that enough? Or do we still want more? And now Macbeth has had that seed planted in his mind. You could be more. You could be king. And that fantasy, that hidden secret desire of Macbeth's. Now that spark is lit a flame that's burning inside of him. And everything that should have filled him up with satisfaction and comfort, now he feels empty. Now he feels nothing.
Bankwell interrupts his thoughts by saying, look how our partner's wrapped. Macbeth doesn't even hear him and keeps talking to himself. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. And Macbeth is thinking to himself, he's like, okay, 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 okay. Calm yourself down. You don't have to murder Duncan. It is entirely possible that we're going to go to meet up with Duncan and he's going to say, I'm next in line to become king. If, if fate is going to make me king. I don't have to do anything to become king. It's going to happen for me. So I can compartmentalize. I can take all these bad, murderous thoughts that I'm having right now and just lock them up in a box. And I don't have to think about that. I don't have to do anything bad. Because if I'm going to become king, I'm going to become king. Now, Banquo continues, and I think there's a typo here. New Horrors is what they typed in here. I'm pretty sure the MIT website that I stole this off of has a typo. I think that's New Honors, all right? New Honors come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mold, but with aid of use. Banquo's response is like, don't worry about him. He's just tripping off the fact that he got made Thane of Cawdor. Have you guys ever been in a situation, this is that clothes motif again, where you got the new shirt or the new dress or whatever the case may be, and it hasn't been broken in yet, so it still like doesn't fit your body the way the clothes that you've had forever fit your body, where they learned to mold themselves to you and only you? That's what Banquo says about these new honors. These new honors, they just don't fit with Macbeth yet. He's not used to this idea of being a double thane. Give him a minute. He'll come back to himself. And Macbeth, still lost in thought, says, Come what may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. So whatever's going to happen is going to happen, is what Macbeth is saying to himself. Banquo interrupts him again. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Like, hey, dude, we're waiting for you. And Macbeth's response is, give me your favor. My, my dull brain was wrought with... Things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us towards the king. Think upon what hath chanced, and at more time, the interim having weighed it, let us speak our free hearts to each other. So a lot of times this is played as a split conversation. To Ross and Angus, he's saying, guys, I'm sorry I was distracted. I don't even remember what I was thinking about. Doesn't matter. All right, I'm sorry for wasting your time. Let's get going. And then he pulls Banquo aside and says, think about what we just heard. Think about what's happening right now. When we get a chance, after we've both thought about it a little bit, I want to talk to you about what all this means. And Banquo's response is, very gladly. Macbeth, till then, enough. Come, friends. And together, the four of them roll off to go meet Duncan. All right, so we cut away from those four. We're now back at Duncan's camp. We've got Duncan, his two sons, Malcolm and Donald Bain, Lennox, who's another Thane, and some other attendants hanging out with them. All right. Now, once again, with this, this conversation, you're getting a little bit more insight into King Duncan. So Duncan starts it off. Is the execution done on Cawdor? Are not those in commission yet returned? Now, this might seem like kind of a, a, a simple line that we don't need to read a whole lot into. All Duncan is asking here is, did we execute Cawdor yet? But again, that tells you about him. Is Duncan the one who's executing this person? Nah, he's got other people for that. Duncan doesn't have to face the realities of his judgments, of his actions. He sentences someone to death. He never has to see the severed head. He never has to see the dangling corpse. No, nah, all he's got to do is give the order and then ask, is it done? And Malcolm, his son, also doesn't know firsthand. He didn't go and witness the execution either. Check out what he says. My liege, they are not yet come back, but I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons implored your highness's pardon and set forth a deep repentance nothing in his life became him like the leaving it he died as one that had been studied in death 
to throw away the dearest thing he owed, as twere a careless trifle. Now, there are a lot of interesting ideas going on here in what Malcolm says. And there's an interesting version of this in film that I want to talk about where they undercut everything that Malcolm is talking about here. But first, let's just take it at face value. Let's assume Malcolm actually has spoken to someone who saw Cawdor die and that he's telling the truth. How did Cawdor die? Well, honorably. Now, he was a dishonorable traitor. That's true. But... When it came time to face his own execution, he did it the right way. The priest came, he gave a full confession of his sins. Everything that was evil and bad and treasonous about what he did, he admitted it, and he asked for forgiveness. He purified his soul in his final moments before his execution and knew that having purified his soul when he died, heaven was going to be his. So he didn't cry, he didn't whine, he didn't fuss. He prepared himself for his death the way he thought was right, and then he went to it like a man. Now, later on, when we see other characters faced with their own deaths, think about that as a foil, as a something to elevate that other character's behavior, a contrast for those other characters' behaviors. Because not everybody in this play faces death with that sort of grace now the the film version that i wanted to talk about actually the images what they show undercut turn everything malcolm says into a lie it's interesting they they have malcolm and his dad having this conversation and they cut away from malcolm and his dad to show the actual execution of cawdor and the actual execution of Cawdor is they show a man tied to a chair with a bag over his head, and then somebody walks in and kills him and leaves. There was no confession. There was no beautiful, graceful facing of death. But in that version of it, Malcolm knows what his father wants to hear, and he lies to give it to him. It's an interesting choice. I'm, I'm not sure if I like it or not. But it fits with that motif of duality, where nobody in this play is really honest. Nobody in this play is really true to the bone. Everybody's got a double face. Everybody's fake. And they extend that even to Malcolm in the earliest scene. Like I said, it's an interesting choice. I think it's probably a bad one just because it, it takes away that contrast between going to your death nobly and prepared and the way other people die later in this play. But, like I said, it's interesting, and so I did want to talk about it here. Duncan, after hearing this from his son, is still processing Cawdor's betrayal. He, to some extent, can't believe it happened. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Duncan is like ruminating, internally like processing, like, man, I can't believe Cawdor would do that to me. I, I trusted him with my life. And then he just kind of says, well, whatever. You can't know a person's soul from looking in their face. There's one of my favorite lines from, from another storyline is a character is talking to somebody and says like, well, I trust you because you have an honest face, even though I know honest faces usually are attached to liars. That's what Duncan is saying here. Like, man, there's no way to know who's a liar and who's a truth teller. I trusted that guy and look what he did to me. Now, as he's thinking on that, on that betrayal, here comes Macbeth, Banquo, Ross, and Angus. A little bit of foreshadowing there. Malcolm thinking about the proper way to die. Duncan thinking about who you can trust. And then Macbeth comes rolling in. Duncan is overjoyed when he sees Macbeth. Worthiest cousin! Again, emphasizing Macbeth is related to him. The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before the swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have
have left to say, more than thy due is more than all can pay. So Macbeth, I owe you everything. I wish I owed you less, so then I could actually repay you. But the problem is, you've done so much for me today, I will never be able to truly repay you. And Macbeth's response to this is interesting. He goes cold. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state and children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe towards your love and honor. Macbeth's response is, whoa, man, hey, I was just doing my job. And there's, once again, a double way of reading that. Like, one, it could be Macbeth is not used to, to talking to kings, and he's uncomfortable here, and so he's, he's trying to find the appropriate voice for this, this power figure in his life. Two, he's being cold because he doesn't want to accept Duncan's praise because in the back of his mind, he's still thinking, I might have to kill this guy. And if you're thinking about killing somebody, are you trying to hear them like sing your praises and say good things to you? No, nah, that's only going to make it harder. So Macbeth, with his language, is distancing himself from Duncan, keeping him at arm's length, saying like, whoa, man, I'm just doing my job. Save all that praise stuff. All right. Duncan just keeps rolling. Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and no and will labor to make thee full of growing. So Macbeth, <laughs> this is just the beginning. Uh, you're just a seed right now. By the time I get done heaping all my lavish praises on you, you will have grown in respect and honor and power and wealth. He's offering all this stuff with just this speech right here. And then he turns away from Macbeth. Noble Banquo, that hath no less deserved nor must be known no less to have done so, let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. So Macbeth gets made Thane of Cawdor. Banquo, congratulations, man. I heard you did just as good as Macbeth. Come here, let me give you a hug. <laughs> now, if I'm Banquo, I'm a little, little pissed about that. Here I was right next door to, to Macbeth, standing shoulder to shoulder with him, taking the same risks as him. Macbeth gets to double his wealth, double his size, double his economy, and I get a hug? <laughs> Dang. But Banquo is cool about it. He takes it in stride, and they even play this in a lot of versions of Macbeth as a little bit of a joke. There if I grow, the harvest is your own. It's it sometimes played as, as Duncan is hugging Banquo. He's he's saying, like, if I grow, if I get an erection while you're hugging me, that's all you, dude. And that's a little weird, but sometimes, like I said, it's played that way. Or it's played straight up as Banquo just knowing how to talk to a king just says, if you plant me, then the goodness that comes of my growth is only yours. Take it as you like. Duncan continues addressing publicly his two heroes, Macbeth and Banquo, and he says, My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Duncan is so happy, he's crying right now. Now, this is an interesting thing. Think about your own perspective on manhood. Because masculinity and manhood is gender roles are all throughout this play. Is it okay for a man to cry? Now it's interesting, in the 12 years since I've been teaching, my students' answers to this have changed profoundly. First 10 years of me teaching this. Nah, it's not okay for a man to cry. Men are only allowed to cry in two situations, if your dog dies or if something really heavy falls on top of you. That's it. Anybody else, if you're a man and you cry, you're soft. And that's probably the way a lot of people in Shakespeare's time looked at it. That like the definition of masculinity or the thing that in modern times we've come to term toxic masculinity 
is this gender stereotype that we have for men that if they do have full access to all of their emotions, if they do know what it means to weep, either tears of sorrow or of joy, then, then they're not a man. And in recent times, I think we've come to understand that that's not really healthy. That if you take 50% of the population and you deny them access to half of the emotions that a human can experience, then you start raising some pretty unhealthy groups of your population. If men are only allowed to show anger and rage and be violent, then what good are they outside of the battlefield? This is one of the things Macbeth is going to struggle with, kids. All right. So Duncan, counter to Macbeth, is at peace with his relations, with his relations, with his emotions. Jeez. He can cry in public and be okay with it. Now you decide for yourself, does that make him soft? If you think so, maybe you have a bit of a toxic view of masculinity yourself. But that's all right. You have time for that to evolve and change. Sons, kinsmen, thanes. And you whose places are the nearest, no, we will establish our state upon our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers from hence to Inverness and bind us further to you. Okay. Now, that probably didn't make a ton of sense if you're just listening and reading along with me, but that's okay. Let's break it down. A lot of times when this is staged, it's pretty interesting the way they stage it. Duncan's been talking to Banquo and Macbeth, and he starts out talking about how you two have made me so happy. I am literally crying right now, tears of joy. And now, everyone in attendance, hear my great proclamation. I do declare that the next king of Scotland will be, and a lot of times when they play this, it's, it's Macbeth and Banquo standing directly in front of him, and like Macbeth is starting to pump himself up. He's like, oh my God, it's going to happen. He's going to say, I'm next in line. He's going to say, I'm going to become king. It's going to happen. The witches were right. And then Duncan says, Malcolm, <laughs> and he walks right past Macbeth and hugs his son. Think about how deflating that must have been for Macbeth. You ever been in a situation where you were expecting something good and then it ended up getting to somebody else? When I was a little kid, I hated Christmas because my mom, she loved her children and she always got us nice gifts, but she got distracted easily and sometimes she put the wrong, she still to this day does this, she puts the wrong label on the gift so a gift that was intended as something special for me would have my brother Jason's name on it so like when I was a little kid I was obsessed with sharks like I watched movies about sharks I read every book I could find about sharks I thought sharks were the coolest thing in the universe and then on Christmas one year I can still remember so I was in third grade we're unwrapping our presents on Christmas morning and you know, you unwrap your gift and then you take a break and you watch somebody else unwrap their gift. And my brother Jason unwraps his gift and he gets a real shark. It was like a shark in a jar, a pickled shark. And I'm like, Jason doesn't even like sharks. I'm the one who's the shark fanatic. What happened? And I knew mom got confused but on christmas morning i can't say like hey that's mine and then jason ended up getting the thing that like should have been my special gift and i got like socks to be expecting or to be wanting something great and then see that awesome thing given to somebody else man that sucks and macbeth thought he was going to get the biggest thing of all he was going to become named king in waiting and now he's just waiting because Malcolm's the one who gets everything.
Now, Duncan continues on where he's like, don't worry, everybody here who has served me faithfully, I'm going to take care of all deserving parties. I am not done in sharing with all of you who are still loyal to me. But for now, I've got another great gift I'm going to give to Macbeth. Guess what, Macbeth? I'm coming to your house for a party. That was the other great honor that Ross was hinting at in the woods. Yea, the king is coming to my house. Now, in reality, that is a great honor. Like Macbeth probably never had like the king come for a sleepover before. And now he's going to come and honor his house with his presence. That's like having God come to your house in these times. But does it feel that way for Macbeth? I'll tell you again about my Christmas. Every other present I unwrapped from that point forward, whatever it was, it, it, didn't, it didn't feel like it was anything. I don't remember anything else that I got that year because what I thought I should have got was given to somebody else. Now, maybe that shows you my own personal weakness and my own like selfishness, and there's probably a ton of privilege in there too, but that's the truth of my experience. And I think... I think Macbeth is feeling the same way here. So, Macbeth looks at Duncan. He's still processing, but he's trying to find the right words. And he says, the rest is labor, which is not used for you. I'll myself be the harbinger and make the joyful hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly, I take my leave. Macbeth wants to get the hell out of there. He's pissed. And he can't show it. Otherwise, he's going to look like a jerk in front of everybody and be disrespectful to the king, which he cannot do. So he's like, uh, great. All right, well, I'm happy to serve you. Let me go tell my wife that you're coming. I'll catch you later. He wants to get the heck out of there as fast as possible. He's done with this scene. All right, so Duncan gives him permission to go. My worthy Cawdor. And we get, once again, Macbeth now, now processing in his head, the Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else overleap, for in my way it lies. So he's thinking about Malcolm, just named Prince of Cumberland, just named Prince of Waiting, Prince in Waiting. Crap. I got to do something about this. Otherwise, I don't get to be king. I got to do something to put myself on the throne because just waiting isn't going to be enough because if I just wait Malcolm gets the crown and I'm left sitting on the sidelines that's not good enough and then he makes a, a, a tiny little prayer here stars hide your fires let not light see my black and deep desires the eye wink at the hand yet let that be which the eye fears when tis done to see now this is another motif this motif of begging for darkness Macbeth is now nursing some pretty horrible things in his heart his desire to be king his desires to see Duncan die his desires, his appetite for what he feels like he deserves based on what the witches said he was going to get. All of that is making him think some evil thoughts. Now, just to go off on a tangent here again, when I was a little kid, I can remember there was a priest. And I was like maybe first grade. I had just started public school religion classes because I went to public school and then the church said I had to go to church school on Wednesday nights. And so... The priest would come in and talk to us from time to time when we were like learning our Bible history and stuff. And one of the times he came in to talk to us, he was talking about how if we let ourselves have impure thoughts, those impure thoughts will lead us to impure actions. So if we're thinking about how we're jealous about a toy one of our classmates has, it will lead us to either steal the toy or break the toy or do something cruel to that person who doesn't deserve our anger our mistreatment and so he said the way you make yourself a good person is you make yourself think good thoughts 
You control what you think. And if you're thinking something that you would be ashamed for anyone else to know, you have to make yourself stop thinking that. You have to know God can see inside your head. And if God can see inside your head and he knows what you're thinking, do you want him to know you're thinking about these terrible, sinful things? At which point, one of my other classmates was like, well, if God could see inside of my head, I'd just put on a hat. Because we were young and we didn't really understand what the priest was trying to say to us there, but Macbeth is trying to put on a hat. I have these dark desires. I'm thinking about doing dark things. I need darkness to cover that up. So come darkness. Make it so dark that I can't even see what I'm doing. Let me do the deed, but not have to see the sight that comes with it. Let darkness cover my thoughts. Let darkness cover my actions. Darkness is another motif. And then the word deed and done pops off a god-awful amount of times in this play. Deeds and doing and actions are what matters in this play. Keep that in mind as we move forward. And Duncan, of course, oblivious to the fact that Macbeth is now contemplating murdering him, once again, sings his praises. True, worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant. In his commendations, in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him. Whose care has gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. Man, Macbeth is amazing. He's so good, and his goodness makes me look good. It is a banquet to me. Macbeth is, is giving me a feast, and I'm feeding on his goodness. <laughs> we in the audience who know the full story are like, eh, he's actually not that good. He's thinking about murdering you, dude. But this is another example of that dramatic irony that Shakespeare uses so well. Here's Duncan. Like, man, Macbeth's so awesome. And just like two seconds earlier, we get insight in Macbeth's head where he's just like, man, I gotta kill that dude. <laughs> the horns play and everybody walks off stage. Now, apologies for this being so small. I hated to break up this, this speech because it's one of the most important ones in the play by one of like the most important characters that Shakespeare ever wrote, Lady Macbeth. So we'll talk about what makes her so special, what makes her so strong and unique. Um, the scene is Inverness. That is Macbeth's castle. And the first time we see Lady Macbeth, she's doing something interesting. She's reading a letter from Macbeth. All right. So Macbeth is somebody who keeps his woman informed. And the other thing that's interesting here is she can read. Remember in Romeo and Juliet, the fact that Juliet can read means... She's educated, which is unusual for a woman in her time. Similarly, Lady Macbeth knows how to read. She is educated. This is not something that a, a woman in her time would normally be able to do. And the fact that Shakespeare gives her this action tells us that she is a, a different kind of woman. So she's reading this letter, and, and it, it's another form of characterization. Macbeth not only is he riding ahead of the king to try to get home first so he can tell her to get ready for the king's arrival, but before the king's arrival and before his arrival, he's also written her a letter to let her know some of the other good news he's heard. So Lady Macbeth begins. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished, whilst I stood wrapped in wonder of it. Came missives from the king, who all hailed me, Thane of Cawdor, by which title, before these weird sisters, saluted me, and referred to me in the coming time with, Hail, king that shall be. I have thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of the greatness that is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart. 
farewell. And now that's the end of the letter. So Macbeth, a couple of interesting things here. When he talks to Lady Macbeth, he calls her his partner, his equal, dearest partner of greatness. Now, that is an unusual situation, an unusual equality between man and woman in these times. She is his partner. And he loves her so much that he wrote her this letter because he didn't want her to lose a single second of joy. That's how much Macbeth cares about and loves his wife. That's the characterization that we can pull on this. Now, you could interpret it another way. Like, well, is this a healthy love? Like, if I'm coming home from work, do I text my wife that I'm coming home, send a messenger ahead of me that I'm coming home, and then come home? Like, do I do all that or do I just come home? She doesn't need to know my whereabouts 24-7. I don't need to keep her appraised of every single movement of my body. It's changed a little bit in this digital age, but hopefully if you're in a relationship, you guys have enough distance that you get to move of your own choice and in your own spheres. Maybe this is a hint as to maybe it's not an altogether equal relationship that Macbeth does all these things for his wife. Now, when Lady Macbeth starts processing this, we get some more insight into their relationship. Glams thou art, and Cawdor, and thou shalt be what thou art promised. So you're already Thane of Glams, and Cawdor, and you will be king. There's no maybe in here. Once again, if there is the, the skeptic and the believer, Banquo being the skeptic, Macbeth being the believer, if there is a super believer, it is Lady Macbeth, where she's like, oh, they promise you to be king? You will be king. All right, she has internalized this as gospel. It is truth, and she will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Yet I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. So Lady Macbeth is worried here. And she's worried about Macbeth. She fears his nature. And again, this idea of nature, what is natural versus what is unnatural. The nature of Macbeth, as she knows it, is to be a good man. And being a good man, he won't do what needs to be done to make himself king the fastest way possible. She is already thinking about murdering Duncan, but she's worried that Macbeth is too nice of a guy to do it that way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. So Macbeth, you want greatness. You have the ambition to be great, but you don't want to do the dirty stuff it takes to become great. That's her problem, that milk of human kindness. He's too nice of a guy. He wants power and prestige, but he's too good of a person to go and get it for himself. She fears his nature. What thou wouldst highly thou wouldst holy thou wouldst not play false and yet wouldst wrongly win so the good things that you would have in life you want to get them by doing it the right way you don't lie you don't cheat you don't steal in order to get what you deserve Thou wouldst have glams, and that which cries, Thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. So you don't want to do the dirty things that you need to do in order to get what you want, Macbeth. Lady Macbeth's got to find a way to fix this character flaw. Now take a minute and think about this to yourself. Is it possible for a person to be too nice, to be too good? 
one of the things we'll keep coming back to here is Plato. He was a famous philosopher, student of Socrates. Um, Plato argued that to be a good person, you didn't have to do good things. You didn't have to have a pure soul. You didn't have to obey the gods. All that was just garbage. Plato believed that to be a good person, you had to have the right virtues. And what is a virtue? Well, virtue is a quality that is that makes someone nice or good or pleasant to be around. Right? So you've heard the phrase, patience is a virtue. To be a patient person helps you be a good person. Right? If you have the virtue of patience, that's going to help you be a good person. But the other thing that that Plato talked about with this, this idea of virtues is that in order for virtues to truly be virtues, you have to have them in the right amount, what he called the golden mean. All right. So it's good to be patient, but not too good. No, I'm sorry. It's good to be patient, but not to be too patient, to, to say it better. Um, I can be a patient man. I, I can I can wait for dinner if dinner doesn't happen exactly when I think it should happen. I'm not going to get mad and yell and scream about it. I, I can wait. I can be patient. Now, if I'm too patient, I could theoretically end up starving to death. That would be excessive patience. All right. So virtues can be negatives if they're over applied. Think about Romeo and Juliet. Uh, we talked about that in my classes where it's like Shakespeare's greatest tragedies actually hinge on him reversing what the Catholic Church, when I was growing up, called the theistic virtues. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about there are like three virtues that make life worth living, and these are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You guys have probably heard that before if you've ever gone to a Christian wedding ceremony. It's one of the Bible passages that invariably gets read at those. But Romeo and Juliet shows us, is love always a virtue? Clearly, Romeo and Juliet did not have Plato's golden mean, the proper balance of love. They loved out of balance. They loved each other more than they loved their God, more than they loved their family, more than they loved the laws of their society, more than they loved their own lives. And how did that end up for them? Well, they both ended up dead before they hit 20. So yeah, Macbeth, in the eyes of Lady Macbeth, has excessive virtue. And she's got to find a way to check that. Now, the reason why I went off on that extended tangent is to set up this other secondary tangent that I think we need to talk about, and that has to do with abusive relationships. Abusive relationships are something that happens in today's society. Many of you young people are either dating or someday soon will be dating. And in the course of it, I'm sorry to say, you may find yourself in a relationship with the wrong person, somebody who doesn't treat you appropriately, somebody who doesn't appreciate your virtues. In an abusive relationship, and I think you can make a case that Macbeth is in an abusive relationship with Lady Macbeth, you will literally die waiting for your virtues of patience and kindness and tolerance and forgiveness to be rewarded by your abuser. Macbeth, I think, does love his wife. Does she love him? Check out what she has to say about him. Already we know his virtues she doesn't respect. Let's see what else she has to say here. Hie thee hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. 
So husband, hurry home. I am going to say everything I can say to get my words inside your brain and make you think the way I need you to think, make you act the way I need you to act. She's going to try to teach him to not be so good a man. Because if she can do that, then if he's not quite so perfect, if he's not quite so good, if he's not quite so nice, well, maybe now we can start taking that faster path to the power that we both want. Now, you can argue it either way. Maybe this is, again, not abusive love, but just bad love. Maybe she loves him so much that she's willing to turn him into a monster in order to help him get what he wants. Maybe it's just unhealthy love or toxic love rather than abusive love. You got to make up your mind for yourself what, what's going on here. But more importantly, have these ideas in your head as you start looking at relationships for yourself and for your friends. Be thinking about these big ideas. They haven't changed in 500 years. All right. So she's going to turn him into something else just using the power of her words. She will destroy every barrier between him and the crown, even if it means destroying his own goodness. That's, that's what she's saying here. And then a messenger interrupts her and she stops talking to herself and says, what is your tidings? The messenger replies, the king comes here tonight. Now, Lady Macbeth is shocked to hear this. She knew that Macbeth had gotten this good news, but she had not gotten the news. She was not privy to the information we in the audience already knew that one, Macbeth is hustling home to, to try to warn his wife that the king is on his way, and two, that the king is even on his way. So she is shocked when she hears this, but darn if it isn't good news to her. And her response is, thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? Who, were it so, would have informed us for preparation? So she's like, you're crazy. Macbeth is with the king. He would have told me if the king was on his way here. And the messenger says, so please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows who had the speed of him, who almost dead of breath, had scarcely more than would make up this message. So one of Macbeth's servants who was with him on the battlefield, like sprinted ahead of Macbeth to try to get home to give you this heads up. Macbeth is hurrying home too, so he can see you, but he wanted you to have as much foreknowledge and warning as possible about the fact that the king is on his way. So Lady Macbeth is super happy at this news because it fits really nicely with what she's got in mind. And so she tells her servant, go give that man tending, take care of him. He brings great news. Now that the messenger leaves, she goes back to talking to herself and she's seeing she not only has motive for killing Duncan, now she has the opportunity. To kill a king is not an easy thing, but when the king is just going to show up at your own house and spend the night, well, now you got a chance. But before she can do that, she needs to do some other things. And you can read this next section as either a prayer or her attempting to cast a spell upon herself, but check out what she has to say. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Now, this is one of the most famous speeches Lady Macbeth gets to make. She gets another cool one later on in the play, but this is what's commonly referred to as her unsex me speech. Now, talking about gender roles, the expectation was that men would be the ones who were violent and hard and cruel and mean and all these toxically masculine things, and that women were not allowed to be these things. Women couldn't be ambitious. Women couldn't be desireful. Women couldn't want things. And women certainly couldn't do things to actualize their desires. 
So for Lady Macbeth to become what she wants, which is a person who's capable of making Macbeth into a monster, she has to transform herself. So she says this prayer or attempts to cast this spell, calling on the forces of darkness to take away her womanhood, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown, the top of my head, to the toe, top full of cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Now, the, 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 the meaning of what she's saying here is take away my womanhood, take away my capacity to be a woman, stop me from menstruating, which I don't know if you guys have covered this in your human growth and development class, but that's kind of an important thing for women. That's the act in which uh, an egg passes from her ovaries through, if it's not been inseminated, and it's, it's part of what makes a woman a woman, that, at least in Shakespeare's understanding, that biological capacity. And Lady Macbeth is saying, take this away from me. Going back to the idea of witchcraft, witchcraft is not the promise of something for nothing. You don't get to like wave your magic wand and with that make something appear. Typically the idea of, of witchcraft is that you sacrifice something, you give up something. And here the thing Lady Macbeth is willing to give up is her womanhood. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. So, breasts and milk, that should be something that you guys fully understand. Now, Shakespeare clearly didn't because they didn't have the knowledge of biology and, and anatomy and physiology that we have today. But take away, again, my capacity to make milk, which is associated with a woman's capacity to give birth. Take away my ability to create life as a woman and sustain that life. And in fact, take that milk, which we know she associates with human kindness, and replace it with gall. Now, have you guys ever, like, gotten done eating and a while after eating you get like one of those hiccup burps and a little bit of something comes up from your stomach and gets in your mouth and it tastes like orange juice and pizza at the same time and it's thoroughly disgusting back in the day in shakespeare's time they used to think that that was gall that the substance that we human beings had inside of us that makes it possible for us to be angry and evil and vicious and mean was gall and so she's saying take away my milk my kindness and replace it with this substance that men have that lets them do the horrible things that men do so take away my womanhood and transform me into her idea of what a man is now, once again, if her idea of what a man is is a being that's filled with gall, she obviously has this like idea of toxic masculinity too, that a man should be the one who is angry and evil and mean and violent. And she needs to transform herself into that in order to make Macbeth be the man she needs him to be. Whatever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come thick night and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold, hold. So just like Macbeth in the previous scene, we see her again praying for darkness. Let darkness come and with the thickest smoke of hell blot out the sight of the heavens, blot out my own sight, blot out the sight of my knife so it can't see what it's doing, so God can't see what I'm going to do so that I can kill Duncan and not have to pay the blame for it. As she's finishing up her prayer, her husband comes in. 
and she addresses him. Great glams, worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail after. Thy letters have transported me beyond the ignorant presence, and I feel now the future in the instant. So she talks to him and she's like, my wonderful husband, I'm so happy with the news you've brought me. And for her, the future is now. You're already Thane of Glams, you're already Thane of Cawdor, and by God, you're going to become king. I am so happy you're home. Now again, you get uh, a little bit more characterization going on here. Macbeth, how does he greet his wife? My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. So once again, he calls her his dearest love, and then he hits her with the news. Duncan's coming over tonight. And Lady Macbeth has a loaded question in mind for that news. And when goes hence, when's he going to leave? Macbeth's innocent response is tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. When's he leaving? Tomorrow. Oh, no, he's not, says Lady Macbeth. And then he looks shocked. His wife, his dearest love, has just, in so many words, said, we're going to murder the king tonight. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men might read strange matters to beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. So she starts right in on him. We're going to kill the king. And then when he looks shocked, he's like, oh, she, her response is, oh, baby, when I look at your face, I can see the truth. You need to do something about that. You need to look like the time. You need to learn to be fake. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath it. He that's coming must be provided for. And you can read that two ways. We got to take care of our guest and that we got to like feed him and give him a nice place to sleep. Or we got to take care of our guest and that like we're going to kill him tonight. He that's coming must be provided for. And you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. So don't worry, baby. Leave it to me. I'll take care of everything. And I'm going to get us what we both want. Mac Lady Macbeth is saying, you don't even have to do anything. Just learn how to look innocent and let me do the rest. She's saying she will murder Duncan tonight. Now, Macbeth's response is pretty interesting here. Instead of being like, all right, sounds good, or like, whoa, 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 that's messed up. I can't believe you're talking about killing the king and our house guest. That's not exactly what I would expect my wife to say. I've been married for a few years now, and not once has my wife proposed that we murder any of our guests, I'm happy to say. But if she did, I would probably say like, oh, wait a minute, honey. Let's, um, let's talk about this. I'm not sure I'm okay with you considering the murder of our house guests. But Macbeth, instead of going like either all the way yes or all the way no, says, we will speak further. And Lady Macbeth takes this as him saying yes to her plan. Only look up clear to alter favor forever is to fear. Leave the rest to me. So again, she just reiterates, you don't have to do anything, baby. I got this. I'll kill the king. And then they walk out together. All right. So in front of Macbeth Castle, we get this moment once again of dramatic irony where Banquo and Duncan are talking about like, wow, this is a really nice place. Like even the birds are happy here. Like this is, this is a really beautiful castle, man. While we in the audience are just like, oh no, <laughs> Duncan, this is, this is not so nice a place for you, my friend. So Duncan begins, this castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly commends itself unto our gentle senses. So if Duncan's looking around like, yeah, this is a nice place. And Banquo stacks on top of it. He sees in nature signs that this is a good place. This guest of summer, the temple haunting Marlet does approve by his loved mansionry. 
that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No juddy, frieze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed in procreant cradle, where the most breed and haunt I have observed. The air is delicate. So yeah, this is such a nice place. These birds that normally only build their nests in like castles or really strong buildings have instead chosen to build their nests here, raise their babies here. And wherever I find the marlet, this type of bird, it usually means it's a really nice place. And then Lady Macbeth comes on stage. See, see, our honored hostess, the love that follows us sometimes is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God Ildus for our pains and thank us for your trouble. So Duncan is joking with Lady Macbeth here, saying he's sorry for the inconvenience of his presence. I'm sorry we came without giving you a lot of time to get prepared. I'm sorry you have to put up with us as your guests. But I promise you, God in heaven and I will repay you for the trouble that I'm bringing you. And Lady Macbeth, putting on her best lying happy face says, all our service in every point twice done and then done double. For poor and single business to contend against these honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignitaries heaped to them, we rest our hermits. So Lady Macbeth is saying, look, I'm sorry our house isn't much, but what we have is yours. And to make sure we're prepared for you, We've done everything we possibly could to get ready for you. In fact, we were so busy trying to get it, we did it twice, and then we did it twice again, just to make sure we made everything as comfortable and as beautiful as you could here. And for us in the audience, again, this du du duality, this double doing, this double facedness that she's showing here in the actions and in the deeds, done and done double, double bubble, toil and trouble, this double language all throughout this play. Now, Duncan is happy to talk to Lady Macbeth, but where's the Thane of Cawdor? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well. And his great love, sharp as his spur, hath holped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guest tonight. So Duncan says, where's Macbeth? Let's go see him. We were trying to keep up with him so that like we could all show up together, but he was too fast. So can you take us to him? And Lady Macbeth's response is, your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs, in comp to make their audit at your highness's pleasure, still to return your own. So we are your servants, she says. We're here only to serve you, and that is our payment. Duncan says, Give me your hand and conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. So I'm not done showering gifts and affection upon Macbeth. I love him so much. Take me to him. And then they walk out together. So now we're in Macbeth's castle. The party, the celebration of the victory with Duncan and his men at Macbeth's castle is in full swing. And Macbeth has stepped away from the party. And you have like the servants bustling all around him to have this soliloquy. Now, normally in, in classes, we talk about soliloquies as a speech where you only have one character on stage by themselves. But it's not always the case. Sometimes you have a soliloquy where the person on stage is talking and there are other people there. It's just that the person on stage either doesn't acknowledge them, doesn't care about them, or doesn't know about them. It's why you can have Juliet's famous balcony soliloquy where she's talking about her true feelings for Romeo with him listening in on it. And it's still a soliloquy. All right. She's talking, doesn't know or doesn't care that he's there. Hamlet's famous to be or not to be speech, same situation. He's giving this speech while he's being spied upon by his uncle and another guy. Here we've got Macbeth ignoring the servants who are bustling around behind him, thinking about murdering Duncan. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. So if I'm gonna do this, I need to do it fast. 
If the assassination could trammel up the consequence to catch with surcease success. So I just wish that when I did it, that was it, that it would be done and over. But he's worried about the consequences. I can murder Duncan tonight. But what comes next? What price will I have to pay, either in this life or in the next? Because to murder a king in Shakespeare's time, not Macbeth's time, but in Shakespeare's time, that was essentially murdering God's agent on earth. Like from the King Arthur story, when he pulls the sword out of the stone, that sword is a cross, and that is indicative of God's favor for Arthur. He is the man God chose to be king. And in Shakespeare's time, it was believed that the king ruled by God's favor. So if you kill the king, you kill God's agent on earth. And Macbeth is reflective of that line of thinking, probably more than like the actual 10th century Macbeth would have thought about it. But anyway, that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach the bloody instructions, which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. So Macbeth is worried about the mistakes people make in life. Now, one, the choices that we make in this life set us up for suffering in the afterlife. That's one problem. If I do this, I'm going to hell. I'm not going to be able to, to get out of that. But more immediately, sometimes if we do bad things in this life to get what we want, we end up being punished in this life for the bad things that we've done. The poison that we put out into the world is returned to our lips. It's karma. What goes around comes around. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. What Macbeth is doing here is he's making a pros and cons list of like, should I, should I not murder Duncan? Murder Duncan? Okay, pro. Maybe I become king. Con. Well, I'm going to go to hell. Two, there's no guarantee that I'm actually going to become king and I might even end up being punished for murdering the king. Three, I have a duty as his kin, as his blood, to take care of him. I have a duty as his subject to take care of him. I have a duty as his host to protect and take care of him. He's here, not just in double trust, but in triple trust. And I'm going to kill him? This is the thing about Macbeth that's so interesting, is he's not a cold-blooded killer. He knows it's wrong. He's a killer with a conscience. He's a calculating man. And right now, the arithmetic in his head is adding up to, I should not do this. This is wrong on every level. He has some more reasons why he shouldn't do it. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Apparently, Duncan has been a kind and generous king. Maybe not a feared military king, but the people love him. And if they love him, then they will hate anyone who follows after him especially if the person who follows after him takes over because of his murder. And pity, like the newborn babe striding the blast of heaven's cherubims, horsed upon the sightless counter couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. So, Duncan's goodness, heaven's goodness, all of this tells me I shouldn't do this. So why should I? 
I have no spur to prick these sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Macbeth has talked himself out of murdering Duncan. The only justification he has for what he wants to do is his own ambition. And let's be honest, ambition, when it's too great, Macbeth knows, gets you messed up. So he knows he shouldn't kill Duncan. Now here comes Lady Macbeth, wondering like, where the heck's my husband? Macbeth sees her coming and asks, how now? What news? Lady Macbeth, who's a little bit ticked that her husband is missing in action as the king is having dinner, says, he hath almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? He's almost done eating. Why are you standing out here talking to yourself? Hath he asked for me? No, you not. He has. All right, so is he missing me? Is he looking for me? Macbeth asks, and Lady Macbeth says, you know he's looking for you. All right, Macbeth sucks it up, and he faces a person that he may even fear in his wife. We will proceed no further in this business. We're not doing this. We are not going to murder Duncan. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought the golden opinions of all sorts of people, which now would be worn in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. So Macbeth has been given honors that he wants to enjoy. He, again, we have that language of clothing. I've just been given these new robes. I don't want to get them dirty with the murder of my king just yet. Interestingly, Lady Macbeth and her reply here is pissed. And watch what she has to say here. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? Now, you guys are young, and I'm sure a lot of you don't have experience with alcohol, but it's a kind of motif, actually, in this play. Alcohol and what it does to people. Lady Macbeth is talking about the phenomenon of beer goggles, where when grown-ups drink alcohol, sometimes as they imbibe to excess, their inhibitions, the, the checks and balances of their brains, the things that tell them, no, stop, don't do this, get relaxed. And all of a sudden, that person that you don't particularly find attractive and that you don't like that much starts looking pretty good. And after a few more drinks, you're ready to go. And Lady Macbeth is asking her husband, is that the situation that we had here? Were you drunk? Did you drink yourself into the mood of doing this? And now you've woke up, and looked at what you did and thought, ugh, that was a mistake. Because a lot of times that is the outcome of beer goggles. That person that... You only were attracted to when you were drunk, when you sober up, is no longer so attractive. And you're like, oh God, I've made a horrible mistake. Lady Macbeth is asking her husband if that's what he's been suffering from in terms of this reversal of course of action. And then she says, from this time, such I account thy love. Look at what she's doing there. You changed your mind about killing Duncan. Were you drunk in your ambition? Did you sober up that now you regret it? Do you feel the same way about me? She's creating a circumstance here wherein the only way Macbeth can prove that he truly loves her, that it wasn't just beer goggles that has made him love her for the years that they've been married, is to murder Duncan to go against all of his own principles, to, to contradict his own nature. And to get him to do that, she'll use any tool available to her. Art thou a fear to be the same in thy own act and valor as thou art in desire? Are you scared? Are you scared to take what you want? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. Now, 
There's some double meaning going on in that last line. But once again, are you a coward? Would you live wanting something that you could have but were scared to take? Or would you take it implicitly like a man would take it? And there was an old adage, an old saying, talking about how the cat would have the fish, but for the fact that he was scared of getting his paws wet. That's the nice way of taking what Lady Macbeth is saying here. The other less polite way of looking at that double entendre is sometimes when, even in today's parlance, when we speak of someone who is less than manly, they make reference to him as a cat or the female genitalia, slang for a cat. And you get what she's saying there. She's attacking his very manhood. Do you love me? Are you a coward? Are you a man? Now hit with this onslaught, Macbeth doesn't get angry. He says, prithee, pray thee, peace. He is not commanding. He is not ordering. He is asking. And then the word he chooses is peace. The cessation of turmoil and hostility. He has a rebuttal for her. I dare do all that may become a man. He who dares do more is none. And it's an eloquent rebuttal. He counters her argument, calling him a coward, questioning his love for her, questioning his manhood by saying, I'll do anything a man should do, but I will not do what a man should not do, because if I do what a man should not do, then I am not a man. He's using logic here. I dare do all that may become a man. If a man should do it, I will do it. But anyone who does what a man shouldn't do isn't a man. And what you're asking me to do, to murder my king, my kin, my guest, that's not manly. But Lady Macbeth, she's not hearing that. What, be nah, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. So until you kill Duncan... You're not a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. And if you do murder Duncan, you won't just be a man. You'll be a superman. You'll be a king. You'll be my king. Nor time nor place did then a hear, and yet you would make them both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. Now that's a tongue twister of a sentence, but what she's saying here is we couldn't ask for a better situation to murder Duncan. And yet the fitness of this situation, we have him here in our house at our disposal. And that's what's making you chicken out. He is essentially asking you to kill him. And the fact that he's given you the perfect opportunity to do it makes you scared. Now, this is where Lady Macbeth turns truly cruel. And, and the language here, I, I, I struggle with as a father. But listen to what she says. I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have to done this. Jeez, I've been a mother and I know what it means to love the babe that milks me. Now, where are Macbeth's children? They do not appear in this play. The implication is they have had children, but those children have died. And Lady Macbeth is willing to use the death of her own children to attack her husband, to force him to do what she wants him to do. Now you could argue she's trying to transform him into the man he needs to be to become king, but if you had to go after him like this, 
throwing their dead children in his face. And then doubling down on that to say, those children of ours who are now dead, I would rather have murdered those children than stay what you have just said to me. You tell me you're not going to murder Duncan. You're telling me that you won't do what it takes to become king. I'm happy our children aren't here to see this. I would rather I killed them myself, despite the fact that I loved them, than let them see what their father is. And now, not only is he not a man, he's not even a woman. And if he's not a man, and if he's not a woman, then what is he to his wife, his dearest love, his, his partner? He's nothing. And Macbeth doesn't have a rebuttal for this. The only thing now he can fall and hide behind is, if we should fail, what if this goes wrong? Lady Macbeth reply to the question, what if we fail? She says, we fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. So if we fail, we fail. But if you screw your courage to the sticking point, and there is a double entendre here. Now, when we're talking about screwing to the sticking point in Shakespeare's time, what that means is for an archer, when he draws back on the bow and he pulls all the way back the arrow to his shoulder, that's what's referred to as the sticking point where you can sit and wait and aim and be ready. Screw your courage to the sticking point. Now, here she is in a speech questioning his manhood, talking about courage being screwed and a sticky place. There's a sexual undercurrent to what she's saying here. Now she hits him with the plan. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall, shall his hard day... Blah, 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 I'm going to try that one more time. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him? His two chamberlains, I, with wine and with sail, so convinced that memory, the warder to the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. So, when Duncan goes to sleep, and after the day he's had, he's going to sleep tonight. I'm going to bring wine to the men who guard his door. And with wassail, which means with partying and wine, I will get them so drunk that they fall asleep. And then they won't know what happens. They won't remember what happened. When in a swinish sleep their drenched natures lies in death, what can you and I, what cannot you and I perform on the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? So, Macbeth, I have a plan. When he goes to sleep tonight, I'll get his guards drunk. And when they're passed out, you and I can go in and do whatever we want to Duncan, and no one can stop us. And then we'll frame the guards who are drunk outside his door. It's the perfect crime. Now, there's an interesting thing here. In criminology, it, it's a largely discredited theory, but it, it's an interesting idea. There's the idea of what's called drift theory, where before someone becomes a criminal, the first thing that they do is they think about becoming a criminal. They even plan out how they might go about committing the crime, and over time, eventually, they just kind of drift into that planned criminal behavior. Lady Macbeth is trying to help Macbeth drift into becoming the man she wants him to. She gives him the plan, a plan that could work. And his response is to tell his wife, bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two that his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death? So Macbeth's response is like, geez, you're some kind of woman. 
make sure if we have any other babies, you only have boys because there is nothing in you that should create a woman. But this could work. You could do this. And anyone, Lady Macbeth says, who thinks that it's not right will be convinced by the way we scream and act outraged that it happened when he's dead. So Macbeth says, I am settled, and bend up each corporeal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what false heart doth know. So all right. You've convinced me. I've made up my mind. We're going to do this. Let's go put on our fake faces, act the part of the gracious host and hostess, and then tonight we'll do what we need to do. And then they walk out together. All right. So that's the end of Act 1. Act 2, which I promise I'll get out as soon as I possibly can, we'll get to see Lady Macbeth and Macbeth as they go about the commission of the murder, which, although it is an incredibly intense and dark and wicked scene, actually has some jokes and some laughs in it too, as you shall see. But that's the end of Macbeth Act 1. This is for everyone who's, who's redoing the midterm, everything that you need to know in order to be successful on that midterm. So, if you're, you're redoing your midterm or making that up, this is the time to go and make sure you've got access to that document. If you don't, shoot me an email. I will get it to you immediately, and then you'll be well on your way to getting a very good grade for third quarter. Everybody else, if you're just doing this for grins, I hope you enjoyed Act 1. Act 2, which for my part is actually the most fun of the play, we'll get to do that soon. All right. I hope this finds you all happy and well. I miss you guys, and I hope I get to see you soon.